name's Simon Simpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 80 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. Today's guest speaker is um, Earl Arnold from AIB International. And Earl's going to be discussing training employees on food safety and quality. Obviously, it's vital that everybody pulls together in the organization uh, and is on the same page in terms of food safety and quality management. So Earl's going to be giving us some tips about uh, programs to achieve that. Um, just to say, today's webinar on the Food Safety Fridays webinar program is sponsored by AIB International, uh, where Earl's from, uh, Metla Toledo, Trace Analytics, and, and Safe Food 360. Uh, for those of you who are regulars, obviously you're already commenting in the sidebar, uh, saying hello, so welcome to you, uh, you know, hello from Germany, uh, Lagos in Nigeria, New Jersey, from all over the world, you're all very welcome. Uh, all you need to do is type in, you can type questions, comments uh, throughout the webinar, the Q&A will be at the end, but uh, I will uh, monitor the sidebar and flag any questions up. Um, okay. Uh, for now, I'll, I'll head over to Earl and introduce you. You there, Earl? Yes. How are you doing, Earl? Good. How are you today, Simon? I'm very good, thank you. Um, would you tell the audience where you're dialing in from? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm dialing in from Austin, Texas, where right now it's a little bit sunny and unre un unseasonably a little bit cooler than usual. Good. Is that? Do you think that's related to the hurricanes and things like that? Or? I do, because we're just recovering in, in the Houston area from Hurricane Harvey, and now we have the uh, other one coming into our Florida area. So I think that has something to do with it. Okay. Well, let's try and get this presentation done before before the, Jose is the next one, isn't it? Before Jose comes. Right. Okay, Earl, if you get your slides ready, I'll tell the audience about next week's webinar. All right. Okay, ladies and gents, in the sidebar, you should see under the Offers tab, uh, that's a, a photo of uh, Jennifer McCreary from NSF International. Next week, she's going to be talking about developing a supply chain program for regulatory GFSI compliance, some tips on managing your suppliers. Uh, so hopefully you can join us. Click the Register Now button, it'll open a new window and just put your name and e email address and you'll be subscribed for that. But for now, I will hand you over to Earl. I'll see you later. Okay. All right. So good morning, everyone. And I want to thank you, uh, Simon, for the kind introduction. And it's always a pleasure to be a guest here. Uh, I've done one other webinar um, with you, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to this one, too, as well. So today we're going to discuss training. And I want to kind of focus the discussion on training requirements for um, GMPs. Um, GMPs are important, and I've had a chance to take a look at what the FDA and FISMA is asking for, as well as what some other regulatory countries required guidance is, like Canadian Safe Food Act and even China's new food safety laws. So I'm coming from that perspective, but I do want to focus on the GMPs and that, and that type of discussion. So the first thing we're going to do is jump into our first poll question. And Simon, I'll let you uh, run this portion of it. OK. Um, so the question is, what is the difference between training and education? So is there a difference? Um, if there is, well, there must be. Um, what do you think it is? So if you could just type in the sidebar, um, what is the difference between training and education? And then we'll pick up on those. Uh, let's see. Oh, we've got Stephen there saying howdy from Texas as well. Uh, oh, excellent. Maybe you know him. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, from all over the world. Uh, Abdallah from Egypt. Okay, Natalie, training is putting what you learn into practice. Uh, uh, Adrian, short term versus long term. Vivian, training, hands-on, practical, educationist theory. Osama, training, outputs, our skills, ability to apply. Vidi, training, more physical applications. Training is giving education. 
Education happens all the time. Training refers to specific sessions. Mm -hmm. Training is more job specific. So lots of different, uh, are they on, on the right sort of lines there at all? Yeah, they sure are. You're, you're, you guys are a, a very intelligent group and we can tell that. What we're going to look at though is from the education and training aspect for food facilities is training is kind of defined as a process by which someone is taught the skills that are needed for that art, profession, or job. In other words, you're going to tell me how I'm supposed to do something. So we'll switch it over to food safety and I need to train my receiver on how to do the bulk liquid receiving operation. And so I'm going to go through all the required steps, one, two, three, four, five, and tell this individual what they need to do. Education's slightly different, and education is the knowledge, the skill, and the understanding that I get from the training. In other words, why is doing this task this way important? So I'll flip it over again to food safety, and a good way to describe this is I know all of you out there that are involved in food safety, one of the basic things that you train and educate your ed, uh, personnel on is hand washing. And we train them that it's important to wash our hands, scrubbing vigorously, putting enough soap for lather, and roughly uh, doing this process for about 20 seconds. We always teach sing happy birthday internally or the ABC so that we can get that time frame that we're looking for. But do we also educate them on why washing hands are important so that um, culturally we have a lot of different uh, individuals that work in our facilities. I, um, when I first initially started auditing with AIB, one of my first facilities I visited had seven, seven different languages spoken at the facility. And seven different languages also equivalates to seven different types of cultures. Now, depending upon how I was raised and taught, I might not understand why it's important to wash my hands other than I wanna get the dirt off. I might not understand that there's microorganisms and so educating me on why it's important, you know, to prevent norovirus outbreaks uh, and, and so forth is what we're also talking about here. So again, training, how to do something, and education is why is it important. So now I wanna jump into and talk about the different types of training methods. Now, these are not the only ones. Uh, there's about six different types, but what I wanted to focus on was the ones that we normally use in the food industry. So first and foremost is technology-based learning. And this is the most common form of learning via technology. And it's the most important one nowadays because we can, um, it's based on PC programs and we utilize those like Alchemy or other online training sessions. It's interactive, like the one we're doing here where we're doing a live webinar session and you're able to input your uh, observations or answer questions to the polls that we're providing so that you can get that interaction. Um, there's also other forms such as interactive video and, and, and the sky's the limit for technology-based learning. Now, the other one that we have up here is on-the-job training. This is honestly the most common form of training that we have in the industry for our line workers. This includes hands-on training, which has been identified as the best method of learning. So if I go back to that scenario I was talking about with uh, training the receiver on the bulk liquid receiving procedures, uh, this is probably the method I might utilize. I'm going to have the individual join me and I can demonstrate when I have a truck that comes in on what's the proper steps to uh, do that receiving bulk liquid. Um, additionally, lectures. Now, lectures is... Um, usually conducted in a classroom setting. Uh, benefits can reach a lot of individuals at one time, but the shortcomings are it's, it's the least identified method of learning. In other words, a lot of people don't learn the best way in this type of setting because there's no interaction. And in most cases, some people are afraid to ask questions because they don't want to be laughed at or feel like they're asking a dumb question. Uh, but although lectures allow us to reach a lot of people in a quick time frame. The last method I have up here is coaching and mentoring. This gives trainees the chance to ask questions and receive thorough and honest answers from someone who's been doing the job for a considerable amount of time. Something that they might not receive in a classroom or with a group of people. Not only that, but they get experienced answers from that person that's done that job for several types. So um, these are the types of training and education methods that we utilize in, the, in our food facilities uh, primarily today. 
So now I want to talk about who needs training for food safety. Now, although in, in the next few slides, I'm going to be talking about some of the U.S. requirements, I want to throw out a, 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 a caption here. I have also done a cross-reference with the Canadian Food Safety Act and China, uh, China's new food safety regulations. And even though they're not identical, a lot of these requirements that we're going to talk about and things that we want to suggest is pretty much paralleled in these other additional regulations. So even though we're saying FSMA or talking about uh, U.S. laws, we also mean uh, Canadian and China and other global food safety uh, parameters such as GFSI schemed audits. So who needs training? So the individuals that need training in a facility is anyone who performs food safety activities. And specifically for the individuals that are preparing the food safety plan, who's conducting a hazard analysis to determine what our gaps might be, uh, developing preventative controls and performing a, a reanalysis. So it's really important that we make sure that we understand that individuals are required to be qualified. So we need to make sure that they're trained and educated so that they can uh, make sure that they're good to go. Now, the requirements that we have listed up here are consistent with FISMA, but they're also consistent with other uh, initiatives such as FSSC, BRC, SQF, and other regulatory uh, um, countries. Now, specifically for FISMA, one of the parameters of the uh, food safety program is we have to have a preventative controls qualified individual, which this requires additional skills specific to a hazard analysis. So we need to demonstrate that. Uh, the specific rule says that this individual has to have equivalent training that's, that's, that's similar to the standardized curriculum that's recognized by the FDA. And right now the FDA from the food safety side has only recognized the FSPCA course on the preventative controls for human food rule. But this is not the only way that we can uh, demonstrate that we're a qualified or a preventative controls qualified individual. We can do it through other training and education, such as uh, having a science background in, or a, a, a master's degree in, in science uh, food safety or other type of knowledge, such as maybe I've been uh, HACCP certified for the last 10 years and have been working in my industry for the last 10. So all of these things can help support that I am considered a qualified individual as it stands for uh, food safety. Now, this is the one that I really want to focus on because this rule and also the Canadian Food Safety Act and also the China's new food safety regulations talks about individuals needing to be qualified. So they specifically focus on training of any individual that's doing anything such as what we have here. Now this requirement that you see on the screen is really coming out of the FISMA regulations, but it's almost uh, identical to what's being asked in other regulations too as well. So it states that a person who has the education, training, or experience, or a combination thereof necessary to manufacture, process, pack, or hold clean and safe food as appropriate to the individual's assigned duties. And it's also saying that a qualified individual from the FISMA perspective is not necessarily somebody that has to be uh, from the facility. In other words, we can hire a consultant to help us in areas that we might be lacking in having that special or expertise. So the, FS, the FDA specifically indicates that individuals assigned to implement preventative controls must be qualified to do so. And that's what we're talking about here. So when we end up looking at our food safety plans and we've developed or we've identified hazards and we've identified ways that we're going to control those hazards, we need to train individuals on what those roles and responsibilities are going to do. We're also required to ensure that all of our employees that's going to have anything to do with food safety um, needs to receive general GMP training. And last but not least, we want to make sure that we do not forget about temporary or seasonal personnel because these individuals also need to be trained and qualified if we put them in roles that, that are important for food safety. In a lot of cases, these are some areas where we forget to conduct training uh, or focus training on because we don't really expect them to be with, this, with us or in our facilities for an extended period of time. 
So what does training for frontline employees look like? First, employees should be uh, familiar with what the company's specific food safety plan is. And not like the whole plan. In other words, we're not going to go through and sit down for hours and explain to everybody this is what our food safety plan is. But I need to understand what my role is within that food safety plan. So if I'm a receiver, I need to know what's important for me to do uh, when it comes to food safety. If I'm a forklift driver that's tra uh, driving allergens from the receiving area back to the secondary ingredient storage area, then I need to understand my responsibilities for that. Additionally, we also need to understand um, the farm to fork scope of food safety in general. So what is food safety from our product from how it comes into our door as ingredients and then the finished product as it leaves the uh, facility? And then understanding if I'm required to any preventative controls that directly affect what I'm doing at my specific site. Now, training and supervisors or training for supervisors. This is kind of really important because our supervisors are going to need additional training and more specific training than what we uh, that our frontline workers have. First and foremost, they need to understand the requirements that are necessary for compliance with whatever regulation that's important to us. So for a facility located in China, then we want to understand China's food safety laws and our supervisors and managers should be very aware of what these requirements are too as well so that we can maintain compliance. Um, if we're required to follow a GFSI scheme, then also we need to understand those requirements as well. And then additionally, I need to understand what my assigned roles are for food safety. So if I'm required to oversee two or three or four different preventative controls, I need to have the same exact training as those line employees are that are doing those. And additionally, if I'm required to do verification activities or even corrective action measures, then I need to understand what that part of my job is too as well. Last or next to last, I need to understand what the legal ramifications are if we're not following these things that we're required to. What can occur? Fines, civilian um, loss of suspension or our facilities being closed down. This is important um, so that we understand that if we're not following through with what we're required to, that there, there are some uh, ramifications that will occur. And then if you are a facility, um, that's requiring to comply with FISMA, it's understood that for the training of the supervisors and managers, there's no recognized curriculum. In other words, there's nothing that says this is what you have to do to ensure supervisors and managers are uh, good to go. So you can develop any training uh, or, or education program that you would like as long as they understand their roles and functions within the food safety system. Now, the most important factor of when you have conducted training and education is to ensure that you can point to records somewhere in your facility that shows objective evidence that training has occurred. This is one of the biggest gaps that I am seeing out in the food industry right now is um, we have trained and educated our personnel, but we haven't, uh, we can't trace it back to objective evidence. I'll give an example. I was recently working with a company um, on food defense and when we were reviewing training records I was asking um, the receiving individuals, hey when was the last time that you were trained on ensuring that you're checking the seals and uh, utilizing the equipment and following your procedures the appropriate way? And they go, yeah I've been trained but I've been here for 20 years and so it's been a while. And then so I went to the management and I said, OK, so can you pull up those training records and demonstrate that this individual has been trained and qualified? And that that wasn't possible for the facility because, you know, they don't keep records for 20 years. They only keep records for two or three years. And that's probably similar to uh, the rest of our facilities. But if you're getting an inspection by the FDA and need to comply with FISMA or even now with some of the other regulatory changes that are occurring across the global scale, we now need to prove that we train these individuals. Not only that, but if we make changes to our policies or procedures, 
we have to demonstrate that we've educated and trained our employees on those changes. And so documentation, we need to make sure that we're focusing on that and proving that we're, that we're doing our training. So what you want to do is have an overview of the training that was conducted and then have documentation on all training. And the documentation can be as follows. It can be certifications. So you went through a professional course and received a certification on, say, PCQI or food defense coordinator or whatever it might be. Also, we can use college records if we have that science-based degrees that support microbiology or food chemistry. We can also utilize the sign-in sheets from training that we've done in plant or having consultants come in, keeping those sign-in rosters as great objective evidence to prove that we've conducted these types of training events. Last but not least, on-the-job training is very acceptable. But in a lot of cases, we do the on-the-job training, but we forget to document it. And it's very easy to do, but we want to make sure that we're capturing even on the job training. So if we use Joe, our receiving uh, individual that's been doing receiving for 10 years, and we have a new temporary or seasonal employee that's gonna be taking his place while he's on vacation, there's nothing wrong with having Joe um, go through a training program, an education program with, with the new temporary employee so that he or she clearly understands the requirements. But then we want to have a sign-in sheet of some form that documents that the training was completed. So now this individual would be considered qualified as well. So we come into our next poll question, Simon. So for everybody out there, what supports training and education in your food facilities? Yeah, OK. Uh, there's plenty of uh, comments and questions coming in. Uh, as well, while while people type in, maybe you want to pick up on that one. What is an acceptable training for non-CCP requirements? Let us put uh, that highlighted there. Uh, yeah, what supports training and education in food facilities? James, management commitment, uh, commitment, alchemy, a specific uh, mm -hmm. work instructions and procedures, records. Your procedures, policies, and SOPs, training logs, and management buy-in, um, senior management commitment, resources, time allocated. So, SOPs, yeah. there's one thing I'm not hearing, and we're going to focus on that next. And we are going to capture that question that you just asked, Simon, as well on what's an appropriate way or how do we want to make sure that we conduct training on those non-CCP things. Uh, the remainder of our presentation is going to be focusing on those things. We're not focusing on FISMA or preventative controls. I just wanted to capture that initially in the training because uh, that's kind of what's driving uh, training and the conversation of training now. But I want to go back and focus on the GMP requirements. But what does support training and education in food facilities is our food safety culture. I'm sure all of you have heard a little bit about this. So food safety culture is basically the smell of the place, the feeling you get when you spend any time in an organization, no matter how large or small. Culture defines what is okay. And what isn't? Culture defines right and wrong, acceptable and unacceptable, meaningful and meaningless. Culture can be strong or it can be weak, but it always exists. And it exists because people who work together must understand the way things are done around here. So this I pulled this information from an article that was written by um, the individual you see on the screen. I, I, I'd have a horrible time of pronouncing it, so I'm not going to do that. But Basically, food safety culture is what's the underlying thought process in a facility? Is everybody on board with change and, and accepts it and is ready to go with uh, supporting that food safety culture? Or is change hard to come by in the facility? Is it a struggle to get people to get on board? And what are those unwritten roles that we have in our facility? And I'll use a uh, event that actually occurred to me as an example. So I was doing an um, audit at a very small facility. It was a very small business. 
and uh, everything was going really well during the audit. We had a, a, a few slight uh, observations, but nothing of major, nothing of a major importance to food safety. And while we were having the discussion, all of a sudden, a gentleman comes in the back door and walks over to the processing line. Uh, the individual doesn't have on proper PPE. In other words, they don't have a hair net. They don't have um, a beard net because this individual had a beard. And they have a watch on. And they're standing there at the production line and the individual reaches over and grabs something off the production line and commences to do a organolaptic test. In other words, they start eating it to test the product. And I'm sitting here watching this occur and I'm shocked. And I uh, turn around to the uh, food safety team that's along with me for the audit. And I say, um, guys, what's going on here? And they all take two steps backwards from me. And I'm like, okay. So I turn back around and I don't see any changes. Nobody's addressing it. And I turn back around to the manager and say, hey, guys, what's going on here? And they all take two more steps back. Finally, one of them speaks up and says, that's the owner. And every day around this time, he comes down to do his own test to ensure that the product that's being produced is acceptable and his standards because his name's on it. I'm like, OK, I got that. Um, but have you guys talked to him about the requirements for GMPs and why it's important not to wear a watch and why it's important to wear a hairnet and gloves when you're touching product and so forth? And they all took a step backwards again. So I went over and I talked with the owner a little bit. I asked him to come aside with me so we weren't directly in front of anybody because I don't believe in embarrassing somebody. And I commenced to have a conversation with him and I said, excuse me, sir, but do, um, what are you doing here? He goes, well, I'm the owner. And he went through and told me what he was doing. And like, you know, what? I think that's fantastic that you're doing this because that shows how important your product is uh, to you and to your business. However, um, take a look at your employees for a moment and tell me what you see. And he goes, well, I see dedicated workers. I'm like, yes. Do you notice anything about what they're wearing? And he goes, they're wearing hair nets and they're wearing gloves. And I go, okay. Um, and why aren't you wearing it? And he looked at me for a minute and he's like, almost like he was very thoughtful. And he's like, no, that makes sense. Why am I not wearing it? And he turns around and walks over to his supervisors and he says, guys, why didn't you stop me from doing this? Why haven't you talked to me about making sure I'm wearing the right uniform and doing the right things? I don't want to set the wrong example. And so this gives an idea of what I mean by food safety culture. This facility had a great food safety culture, but management felt like they were afraid to say anything to the owners or senior management. And so what is our food safety culture like in our facilities? This is what drives our training programs and our education programs and how receptive our staff and personnel are going to accept it. So now I want to change and focus on the good manufacturing practices or otherwise known as CGMPs. Now, um, what we have here is a complete list of the CGMPs that are listed in uh, 21 CFR 110 and 21 CFR 117. However, like I mentioned earlier, um, on the Canadian Food Safety Act, their GMPs are very similar to what you have here. The wording's a little bit different, but the intent is there. And also with the articles in the uh, China's new food safety regulations, um, different types of areas here are covered in those articles listed. So um, this is just an example of um, food safety is honestly becoming more global and everybody's trying to get on the same sheet of music because our um, the way food travels in the world now is a global uh, uh, event. And so everybody is aware of how important our products can affect one another. So the topics that we're going to discuss, and, and, and this, is, this goes along with that question, Simon, you asked, is how important are these things when it comes to training versus our CCPs or our preventative controls? So we're going to talk about personnel training. How do we train our personnel and what are those requirements that are asked of us in our GMPs? Uh, what are some things that we're required to look at when it comes to our plant and our physical grounds around our facility? Sanitary operations in our facility, as well as our facilities and controls that we use to implement them. How about our equipment and utensils, our process and controls, and all the way down to defect action levels? So what I do want to highlight now is, from the U.S. perspective, there has been some significant changes to our uh, good manufacturing practices.
Uh, and what I mean by that is currently right now we have two GMPs in place. We have 21 CFR 110, which has been in existence for quite a while and it had basic GMP requirements in there. And then once the new regulation for FISMA was enacted, uh, GMPs were uh, improved and included in 117. Now, if a facility has not reached a compliance date yet, like right now we still have a couple of days, I think, for the small facilities and another year for the very small facilities, they're still required to comply with 21 CFR 110. But the large companies that's already reached a compliance date for the preventative controls for human food, they're required to implement and uh, meet the new requirements in 117. And I want to cover some of those changes. So one of the biggest changes that was included into the GMPs was how do you how does a facility protect against allergen cross contact? This is a new term that was mentioned, and it's mentioned 24 different times within the GMPs, which kind of highlights the importance. The FDA took this thought process based off of how many recalls we've had in the last few years that are relegated or, or the, the uh, final outcome was due to allergen cross contact issues, either us not listing undeclared allergens or uh, the cross contact of an allergen being included where it shouldn't have been. And because of those recalls, um, they felt that it's important for facilities to figure out how they're controlling allergens and preventing them from getting where they're not supposed to be. Additionally, there were some language changes, meaning that uh, they changed the verbiage from must to shall to try to highlight the importance of the requirements. And then also they added in some stipulations on um, requiring cleaning of non-food contact surfaces and how are you going to do that as frequently as necessary to ensure you're protecting against that allergen cross contact or contamination. And then last, the GMPs for holding and distribution of food byproducts was added from the U.S. perspective. Now, basically what this is, is there's some rules and requirements that a facility has to do if they're going to use some scraps or whatever that's going to be then sold to um, a, a company that's going to change it into animal feed or animal food. So I want to spend a few moments and let's talk about personnel practices. So in our training and education program, I know most of you out there have great training programs on what you do for personnel that's coming into your facilities, whether it's your employees or not. We do a great job of training and educating our employees on how important it is to wash our hands when we dirty them, like after we eat, after we smoke, or we take a break. I know we do this very well for visitors that are coming into our facilities because they're required to read and understand our GMP procedures before they can enter the facility. In a lot of cases, most of you have them sign a document of some form to show that they did receive that training. Um, and in some cases, we do a great job of ensuring we're including our contractors that are visiting our facilities and doing maintenance work or whatever. But sometimes we forget this aspect. So for those of you out there, you might want to go back and look at your training and education programs and make sure that everybody is being covered that needs to be on whatever issue. So when you're looking at your personnel and your practices, how do you train and educate your supervisors and managers on the prevention of disease control? Do you empower them? In other words, um, when, when employees come in the day, and if they look like they have sores on their hands or so, are the are supervisors or managers empowered to say, hey, Joe, you know what? Your hands don't look right. What's going on? Are you sure those are just cuts or, or is that a potential uh, micro issue going on here, like say staff or whatever? Now, it's not necessary to say that we got to send Joe home. But it might be necessary to consider having Joe work somewhere where he's not going to come in direct contact with food. Uh, do we train and educate our supervisors on looking for these type of things? Do we train and educate our employees on making sure that they do come out and say, hey, I think I have something going on. I might need to work somewhere else today. Another thing you might want to focus on is the cleanliness of our outer garments. Um, in one of our training programs we used to have at AIB, we had this great picture of a maintenance man that was walking away from an emergency uh, repair that he was just doing. And from his shoulders down to his waist, he was coated in dust. And what we'd like to enhance on that picture is, okay, this is an individual that just conducted an emergency repair on a line that had peanuts. 
and now he's walking back to his office to finish up paperwork on that repair. But all of a sudden, he gets an emergency call and is required to go and repair another piece of equipment on a different line that does not contain peanuts. Did we train that maintenance guy that he is needed to go and remove his clothing and put on a new uniform so he doesn't create that allergen cross contact? Or is he required to do some kind of procedure before he goes from an allergen line to a non-allergen line? So these are some things that we want to take a look at and ensure we're covering and training too. It doesn't really directly affect a preventative control or a CCP, but it's still something that will definitely prevent a potential food safety issue, and it's sometimes forgotten. Not only from the maintenance guy, but we have other people in our facilities that we call honeybees that go in many different locations. QA, for one, has to go to multiple different lines to pull samples and do other types of uh, observations and tests, as well as supervisors and managers who are addressing issues at, you know, at certain lines. So how do we train those individuals on how they're to treat their outer garments so that they prevent those types of issues? Also jewelry and other types of food safety PPE, uh, we wanna make sure that we enhance on the importance. I have one more small story before we move on to the next section, and that is I was doing another audit at another small facility, and these guys were doing an excellent job, and everybody was following everything when it came to PPEs. I seen multiple people washing hands when they touched stuff that fell on the floor, and it was excellent. We were all the way back near the production line. This was a small bakery, and we were at the uh, uh, mixing area of where they were creating the dough. And we had a nice young lady, a secretary from the office that came all the way back uh, to give a important phone message to the manager who was walking with me. However, this individual um, did have a hairnet on, but it wasn't on properly. And this young lady had earrings and she had a whole bunch of jewelry on. And so she was walking back there. And I can tell by the way everybody was looking that this was a normal practice. Nobody was shocked or appalled. Nobody said, hey, I'm sorry, you shouldn't be back here. So this is something that always occurred. Now, after the young lady gave her message, she walked away. I talked with management and I said, guys, is this a normal practice? Um, to, you know, do you allow individuals with earrings? And like, no. Well, the young lady just came back here with it. Like, you know what? We don't train our office personnel on food safety because normally they don't come back here, but the secretary kind of does. And so this is a gap that we definitely need to fix. We need to train our, all of our people that come back here. And so it was just something that was captured during this process. So plants and grounds. So how do we do training on ensuring that our plant and our grounds are maintained and good repair? So how do we how do we make sure that our people that are putting in new equipment and the placement of that equipment, that they're giving adequate space so that we conduct sanitation operations and be able to produce the food in a safe manner and still be able to conduct maintenance as well. Um, how about the adequate precautions for allergen cross contact? Do we look at the sanitary design of our equipment when we're bringing it in and ensuring that there's no nooks, crannies, or hidey holes that's gonna create issues that's gonna allow for that potential cross contact in between cleanings? Um, how about making sure that our facility is maintained a good repair? So do we have roof leaks and do they get addressed really quickly? And does our employees that observe these type of things, do they notify management or put in the proper work orders so that we can know? One of the biggest things that I've seen in facilities um, as a potential gap is employees have the right heart and the right thought processes where they wanna make sure that they're able to continue to work. So there might be a minor malfunction that occurs on a piece of equipment, and so they conduct a temporary repair, wrap using uh, duct tape or whatever to type uh, to tape up some wires or whatever it might be. But then they forget to put a work order in, and so now we have this potential repair that necessarily isn't a food safe repair that could cause issues. But our employees had their hearts in the right place. So educating them and ensuring that they understand what our temporary repair procedures are, another important key factor of training that we might want to take a look at. Now for sanitary operations, this is important to ensure uh, that all of our people that are involved in sanitary operations are trained and qualified. So what are we required to do for general maintenance? What are we required, what chemicals are we required to use? How are we supposed to mix them up? Have they gone the, through the approval process to ensure that we're using chemicals that are safe in our facility? Um, 
this is one of the other potential gaps I see in facilities where in most cases we have great work instruction procedures on how to do a job and even decent work instruction procedures on how to clean and sanitize. But in a lot of cases, it really isn't a true thorough process where it's literally step by step. We say, hey, you're supposed to clean this, this and this, uh, but we don't go into true detail. So maybe taking a look at our sanitary operations or our work instruction procedures and making sure that that training program of that operation is in, is in full compliance would be a great benefit. You might find out that if you're having potential issues and having to do, uh, you know, if you're doing pre-ops inspections and notice that something didn't get cleaned appropriately, it could be that there might be a step missing or it's being overlooked because the staff might not have been fully trained in the complete procedure. You also want to take a look at pest control operations. Who's trained and qualified to do these? If we're using a contractor, that's uh, fine and good, but we, somebody in the facility still needs to have training and understanding of what those requirements are to ensure that our contractors are doing everything that they're supposed to do as it equivalents to food safety or prevention. Additionally, how about the storage and handling of our uh, cleaned portable equipment? So I know a lot of you out there have pieces of equipment that'll only come in for certain types of production. And then once we're done, we'll clean, sanitize, and then put it off against the side of the wall or something like that. So how do we store that? And are we sure that it's clean? And how do we keep it clean in between uses? Or are we required to re-clean and sanitize before we bring it back into the production process? So training and education of all of these things are so important to food safety uh, this is why I wanted to discuss this because I know a lot of you have been focusing lately on regulatory requirements, GFSI requirements, or FISMA requirements, but GMPs are the driving foundation of our food safety system. If we do not have the training and education uh, conducted on these types of things, such as our sanitary operators, then how are they considered qualified? Are we sure they're qualified? Do they really know what they're doing? And do we have that documentation that goes along with it that shows, yes, my sanitary individuals are, are trained. Yes, my receiver is trained. Now, these are some other things. In most, most cases, are our outlying areas, such as our water supply, or are we, do we have potable water supply? Do we have backflow, backflow preventers? Is our plumbing adequate and does it work right? All of these things are important and mainly handled not by line workers, but by our maintenance staff. But, them un, but they need to understand the importance of these things, too, as well, to ensure that we're good to go. Same thing as sewage disposal, toilet facilities, and even hand washing facilities need to be looked at on their adequacy, their use, and are they functioning properly. I know our maintenance guys are really good at ensuring all of our equipment works and if we have issues, getting it fixed. But do they really understand the nature of food safety? For instance, we'll talk about hand washing facilities for one moment. I know a lot of facilities have great hand washing stations before you go into a production area, and so most of your employees have to stop there wash, sanitize, make sure they have the proper food safety PPE before they can enter the production areas. But how many times uh, is it that when you go ahead and try to wash your hands, the water's cold? If the water's cold, do you really think your employees are going to stand there and wash the hands for 20 seconds um, and freeze, or are they going to do it really quickly and then move on? So it's important for maintenance people to understand the nature of, hey, we want to make sure we have that warm water so that the employees will follow through with the requirements. Same thing with toilet facilities and also removing waste from our facilities. Let's talk about equipment utensils a little bit. And when we did already speak a little bit on equipment and the clean uh, sanitary design aspect, but we also want to make sure that all of our equipment is installed for the, the ability to clean it appropriately. Um, this is sometimes overlooked where we get a new piece of equipment in and we do have our environmental engineers that helped and yeah, this is a great product, we think this is great, let's go ahead and put it in, but nobody really looked at it from how long is it gonna take to sanitize and clean that piece of equipment and is it really gonna be feasible uh, for our processes that we currently have or is it now gonna take a lot longer to do so with this new piece of equipment? So we want to make sure we take a look at those things too as well. And then we want to make sure that the equipment's been installed so that it prevents that cross-contamination or allergen cross-contact. 
Same thing with our freezer and cooler thermometers. Are they calibrated? Are they really recording the, the temperature inside of our um, coolers and freezers, or is it just getting the temperature by the door? Um, so all of these things we want to make sure that we're taking a look at. Now, process controls. Now, these truly are covered by your preventative controls or your CCPs, depending upon what type of food safety plan you're following. But this is included in the GMPs where you need to ensure that you have responsibilities for who's taking care of sanitation and who's preventing cross-contact or cross-contamination. Are raw materials being inspected and tested as necessary? And when you do have them in storage, are they protected from uh, potential microbial or chemical concerns? And then, of course, how about our manufacturing operations? Are they safe for food operations? Next and last, we're going to talk about warehousing and distribution. So it's also important that even if we are just a uh, facility that's storing and distributing food products, that our personnel are trained in general food safety applications and what to do for it. One of the primary concerns that we would be worried about in a situation like this is transportation. Now, I know I've mentioned FISMA many times, and FISMA does have a specific requirement for the transportation of food within its borders. Um, and I know some other countries have those two as well. So we want to make sure that we're including tra training for our loaders and receivers and shippers to make sure that they understand, hey, what are we looking for? Are we doing a pre-inspection of that trailer or conveyance before we load it? Or are we doing an inspection before we unload it to make sure we're not bringing any food safety concerns into our facility? So making sure we really focus training so that we can capture all of these requirements and make sure that we don't have any gaps in our food safety plan. So that concludes my training presentation for today. Uh, Simon, I'll turn it over to you. So hopefully we can do some Q&A. Yeah, if you can um, stop sharing and switch your webcam back on, uh, Earl, that'd be great. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, lots of great content there and uh, loads of comments and questions flying in the sidebar. It's great, actually, because some of the uh, more learned audience members actually answer some of the questions, which is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we'll pick up on, on some of the questions now. We've got 10 minutes left. So, okay, Todd, when it comes to on-the-job training, you mentioned having a sign-in sheet. My question is, do you need to create some type of outline of course material or something that indicates what was covered? So in some cases, uh, GFSI schemes do ask for some kind of general outline or objective evidence like tests or something like that. But when it comes from FISMA perspective or usually from a regulatory perspective, um, there's no true requirement on having an outline of what that training was. Um, I was able to speak to a lot of FDA investigators during uh, training of the preventative controls rule um, because uh, I'm a lead instructor and so we conducted some of that training and FDA is even going through some of that training as well. And I asked them, so when it comes to a PCQI, what are you really looking for as proof of training or even for those qualified individuals? And they go, honestly, I'm not jumping right to the food safety plan and saying, hey, can I see your certificate or how you're qualified? They're evaluating your food safety plan all the way across the board and then determining qualifications based off of that. So the key thing is, is to have that objective evidence that training occurred. So sign in rosters is a good way to prove, hey, Joe, you see, Joe said he was trained last month, and here's my proof. Last month we did training, and here's Joe's uh, information. So that, that's what I was talking about there. Okay, great. Uh, Don, tips for training resistant staff, please. You know, that's a good question. I actually just uh, recently came across that. Uh, I've been working with uh, a couple of different clients on the food defense programs, like I mentioned earlier, and training is a key aspect of that too as well. Um, I was at uh, uh, two different facilities of this one company, and one facility, man, they were just outstanding. They were like rabid dogs. They had question after question after question. They were hungry for the knowledge. They wanted to know how to do it. And then I went to another facility about a month later, the same company, and this company initially was always, why do we got to do this? Why do we got to do this? I don't think I want to do this. It took a lot of coaching and encouragement from me, but by the time we were done with the two-day training event, at the end, 
they were also hungry and now coming on board. Um, what I found is, is usually the initial p pushback of employees when we're starting new training requirements is all they're thinking is, oh my God, I got to do more work. Being able to show them and demonstrate them, one, that they're not going to be alone on this process, and two, how important it is. This is where the education part comes in. Guys, yeah, this is a requirement. We have to do it, but this is why it's important. We want to maintain our jobs, and you can use examples of things that went wrong, like from PCA many years ago where a lot of people uh, got ill or got sick uh, from just what the things that they did, and, and now these individuals are in jail. Uh, like what happened with Bluebell in the United States uh, a, a couple of years ago where their facilities were closed because of a microbial issue. So being able to demonstrate these things on, hey, if we're not going to do these, we could lose our jobs or we could hurt people and we don't want to do that. Use that. That's a good way to bring them around. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, human, how often do we need to do tra training? So that, that's a very good question. And all I recommend is when it comes to your policies or procedures, um, from a FISMA requirement, there is no requirement. In other words, it doesn't say in the regulation that a PCQI has to be retrained every year. It doesn't even say anything about qualified individuals and how often they have to be trained. But what I do caution is if we change a procedure or a policy or have a corrective action on a CCP or a uh, preventative control, and we make a change to our process, then that just goes to say that we need to do retraining and education. Um, I always recommend facilities on the side of caution is we want to do retraining and education annually. Maybe not on everything, but a rotating basis so that we can uh, capture all the requirements for our food safety plan. Yeah. Good. Uh, Human again, what are the best practices for evaluating training effectiveness? So this is a great question and, and one that's being a challenge for facilities now. And I'm going to tie it into preventative controls, whether it's HACCP or HARP-C. Um, one of the things that you're kind of required to do is verify that things are working appropriately. And so one, we want to verify by either a supervisor or manager reviewing documents to make sure they were filled out appropriately. But two, we want to kind of every once in a while verify that the procedures are being followed as we wrote them. And we want to do this, hopefully, without our employees knowing that we're watching them because we want to get a good capture of really what is occurring. And so being able to do this periodically will help you understand, is training effective in education and are they really doing it or are they just saying they're doing it and not following through? Okay. Um, Sarah? What if the person that doesn't want to change is the owner? <laughs> so this is honest struggle, and I, and I do realize this from the food industry. All I can suggest is you really want to come um, with your ducks in a row, meaning gather information on failures that occurred in food facilities. Go to your country's uh, regulatory uh, websites and pull out examples of what's occurring in the industry, what's happening when facilities don't comply. For the United States, it's very easy. You can go to the um, FDA warning letter website and you can actually see warning letters that are initiated to food companies that aren't complying with requirements. And so you can obviously see what's occurring out there. And it's a good way to support that information to your super your owner saying, hey, look, I'm not just trying to create this so that we can do extra work, but look what happened to this company here. They got in trouble and this is what happened to them. And if we can demonstrate that, they might be more likely to come on board and say, okay, I don't want that to happen. So yeah, let's do something. Unfortunately, sometimes they don't get it until something hits them that costs them. That's Unfortunately, that's the case. Uh, Man Quolba. Uh, what training background does the facilitator of the training require? So this is a good question, and I didn't capture that in my training. From a FISMA perspective, everybody needs to be qualified. So um, and, and what I utilize as a good example is common sense. If I'm the QA manager and I've written the procedures and I've developed the, the, the work instructions, then obviously I'm the one that's qualified to teach that. If I've been doing sanitation operations for 10 years and I want to develop a training program for cleaning and sanitation, I should be qualified. That receiver, Joe, that I talked about earlier to conduct that on-the-job training, if he's been doing it for 10 years and he's had no major issues, uh, 
from the FDA's perspective, Joe would be considered qualified and, and would be able to train and educate on the receiving procedure. Uh, so you just want to make sure that you capture that type of qualification. Okay, good. And uh, Jeremy, uh, what about staff that do not enter the plant sales, purchasing, billing? Uh, should they receive food safety and quality training? And so this is a good question. And um, what I would recommend is just look at how they move. So if I'm an individual that's in there and purchasing, I might need to know information about food safety because if I'm the one that's responsible for working with a maybe a new supplier and saying, hey, let's get this ingredient because it might be cheaper, do they really understand uh, what the food safety risks are with that ingredient? So they might need a little bit of training in regards to that. Um, but if I'm an individual that never, ever goes back to the plant and I'm not really doing anything that equivalates to food safety for the facility, then it might not be necessary. Yeah, and I'm sure sales, if you've got sales men and women from time to time, they take uh, customers or visitors around the plant and uh, there's nothing worse than uh, <laughs> a visitor coming around, you know, not wearing the correct gear. It exactly. doesn't do much for advancing the food safety culture. Um, okay, Dale, how to have a good food safety? They're really good questions, these actually. How to have a good food safety performance after the training? So, guys, the best advice I can give you is your self-inspection program. A lot of facilities, when they when they do their self-inspections, um, sometimes they'll have the food safety team assist and they'll say, hey, I want you to take care of this section. If it's a very large facility, I want you to take care of this section. And we focus on sanitation and, and, and those type of things. What we want to do is in, to include in that evaluation results of our training. Are people really following the new procedure we just trained on? Are people really uh, um, addressing uh, food safety issues or is it just that bad food safety culture we kind of talked about where it's not working? Including this element in your self-inspection plan is a great benefit. Not only that, but doing those third-party audits, whether if it's a GFSI scheme or, you know, uh, such as uh, AIB doing a GMP inspection or even that regulatory inspection, the results from those type of things can also identify, is our training effective or is it not? Okay, great. Uh, I've been avoiding the questions that have not been related to training thus far, but I, I, I will uh, pick up on a couple. Jer, Jer, Gerhard, how serious is FSQ in the packaging supply industry, and should packaging should packaging be sanitized before use? Well, so that's going to actually depend upon the product because you know if we talk about sanitizing packaging, would there be any residue left over that could actually create a food safety hazard for that product that's going to go in there? So, um, what I think is 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 a movement that's starting to we're starting to see a lot of interest at AIB is the packaging industry themselves are reaching out and even though they're not regulatory required in the United States to have a kind of food safety plan. They're out there seeking a, a, a version of HACCP that can fit the packaging industry. And we're getting more and more requests for that. So all I can say is you want to work with your packaging suppliers. And, and, and they're probably already searching out for questions to these answers that or answers to these questions you're asking. But they might not know where to go. This is where that enhanced partnership is going to help support these changes. Okay. And... Uh... What are some good topics to address in a HACCP meeting, Sherry is uh, asking. So some good topics to address up in your HACCP meetings is actually uh, preventative controls or mitigation strategies. Um, one of the things that FISMA asks you to look for is reasonably likely to occur and then also reasonable measures that can be employed to reduce that risk that you've identified. This usually gets missed by a lot of companies. They're thinking that if I have this hazard, man, I got to control it and it's got to be eliminated altogether. In most cases, it's just being asked to be reduced the potential of it occurring. And so instead of spending uh, a lot of money trying to fix an identified hazard, we can potentially utilize a low key or very inexpensive way to do that. And I'll give an example. I'm going to switch to food defense for a moment because that's my specialty. Um, food defense says that if you identify a vulnerable area in your facility, uh, that you need to develop mitigation strategies, which is similar to a PC. So um, I was at a facility that made chocolate uh, candies, and we were looking at a production line, and, and I was using this as a story. Okay, guys, right here, 
you have this part of the production line that is exposed to the environment. So if a visitor here at the facility wanted to, this is where they could potentially contaminate the product. However, the only thing they're going to contaminate is that few items that are going across in that time frame. They throw something on there. But if you look at the uh, chocolate system that's right next to it, that's in an enclosed system, this is where if I contaminate the chocolate because it gets recirculated, that anything that chocolate covers is now going to contaminate the product. And so we're talking about a significant vulnerability. So I don't need to spend a lot of money to cover that, that part of the product that's exposed. I want to focus on how can I control people having access to this chocolate because it's going to cover every product. So being able to discuss potential um, mitigation strategies or preventative controls can help maybe uh, look, look at a problem in a different angle and maybe develop different uh, processes to where we can reduce or save money for the company. Whoops. Okay. Uh, I think um, what we'll do, Earl, like we said before, we'll collate these and um, distribute them afterwards and pick up on, on some because we've gone past the time now. Just to, uh, the audience in the sidebar, it, just one, if you are taking away from this webinar, just one thing, one, what one thing are you going to do differently when you get back to your organization or one thing you're going to start, type that in. And uh, Donna's commented there, uh, do a webinar on performing management reviews. So there's an idea. Okay. The how to, the how to get maybe next year. Definitely. Yeah. That, that would be easy to do. Okay. Uh, and it will be very useful because a lot of people do ask about agendas for management reviews, what, what should be included. So maybe we could do that. Um, but for now, Earl, just like to say thank you very much. Um, great presentation, fantastic content, and lots of great. There were some really good questions, and, and you answered all them superbly. So thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, everybody, for joining, and I, and I hope it was beneficial to you, and uh, um, I look forward to gathering the rest of these questions and hopefully providing some answers, too, as well. Yeah, we've just not got enough time in an hour, but yeah. thanks very much, Earl. <laughs> have, have a great weekend. Cheers. All right, thank thanks. You. Cheers. Okay, ladies and gents, I've loaded in the sidebar the certificate of attendance. Just click on the download now button and then uh, you'll get that from Dropbox. I'll be following up with a email with the recording and the slides and the certificate. Uh, and uh, next week we've got um, Jennifer McCreary developing a supply chain program for regulatory and GFSI compliance. So how to manage your supply chain uh, and that'll be good. She'll give some great tips there. So thanks very much for your attendance today, and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great Friday.